Thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode. Hi there, welcome to Up and Adam, I'm Jade. Today's video is about one of the deepest theorems in mathematical logic and a fundamental limit on human understanding. We'll explore logical paradoxes, the nature of information, and the possibility of an algorithm for truth. My hope is that by the end of the video, you'll have a new appreciation for the beauty and power of mathematics. So, are you ready? Our journey begins with an odd question. What's the biggest number you can think of? Maybe it's a Google, a one followed by 100 zeros. To give you an idea of how big this number is, there are between 10 to the power of 78 and 10 to the power of 82 atoms in the observable universe. It's a pretty big number. But what about a Google plus one? Whatever number you think of, can't you just add one more? Or multiply it by itself? Or take it to the power of itself? Numbers go on forever, so is it even possible to think of a biggest number? Also, thoughts are vague. Maybe you're thinking of a number, but you can't quite say what it is. It's more of an idea. So let's make the question a bit more concrete. Let's instead ask, what's the biggest number you can describe? Let's think about this question. If there is a biggest number you can describe, logically that means there are some numbers you can't describe, right? Those bigger than the biggest number you can describe. But why shouldn't you be able to describe any number you like? Well, while there are infinitely many natural numbers, our lives aren't infinitely long. So even if I started counting a new number every second from the moment I was born and lived to be 100 years old, I could only count to 3,155,760,000. But this is a pretty stupid way to describe that number. In fact, just saying the number is already a description of it because you know what number I'm talking about. I could also describe it as the number of seconds in 100 years, which took even less time. So here, we've just described a number in three different ways. One took a whole lifetime, and one took only eight words. But are there some numbers we can't describe? Well, what about a number that was a Google digits long? If we tried to write out this number, it would fill the space out to the most distant visible star. It would be impossible for a human to read out all of these digits in their lifetime. But maybe there's a cleverer, shorter way we can describe it. But imagine the number is so irregular that there simply isn't another way to describe it other than just reading out its digits one by one. There is a realm of natural numbers that simply can't be described by a human being. As you can't describe all numbers, it logically follows that there must be a biggest number you can describe. So the next number after that is the first number that cannot be described by a human. But wait. Didn't we just describe it? This is Berry's paradox, named after the Oxford librarian G.G. Berry. It can be restated as the smallest positive integer that cannot be described in fewer than 15 English words. The paradox being that we've just described it in 14 English words. At the moment, this might all seem like trivial wordplay or language trickery, but we'll see that it reveals one of the deepest theorems in mathematical logic. How? Well, the story starts in 1942, Cleveland, Ohio, with a 16-year-old boy named Ray Solomonov. Solomonov was searching for a general method to solve mathematical problems, an algorithm for truth. Now, because the rest of the video revolves heavily around this idea, I want you to really understand it, both to do justice to Solomonov's genius and also so you can appreciate the brilliance involved. So let me show you what I mean by algorithm for truth. Here's me playing rock, paper, scissors against an AI. Anyone who's played knows that the best way to win is by guessing what the opponent will choose and then picking the object that beats it. The AI is programmed to detect my choosing patterns, but I'm trying to be random. The more we play, the better the AI models what I'll choose. It's aware of a pattern in my behavior that I'm not. You might be thinking, Jade, maybe you just suck at pattern detection. I can tell the difference between randomness and a pattern. Oh yeah? Here are a sequence of numbers. Can you identify the pattern or rule they follow? Pause the video if you'd like to try. 
They're the digits 100 to 1000 of pi. I took out the first 99 so it wouldn't be obvious to the mathematicians out there. They certainly don't look like they follow a simple rule. In fact, to us, they look extremely irregular, even random. Yet they can be generated by a very basic formula. What other information is out there that we think is incredibly complex, but in fact follows a simple rule? Maybe predicting the weather is a piece of cake and we just haven't figured it out. Maybe the theory of everything that is the ultimate end goal of physics is staring us right in the face and we just can't see it. Solomonoff wanted a step-by-step -step set of instructions where we could plug in any set of data and it'd spit out the general rule the data follows, or tell us if there isn't one and we should stop wasting our time looking. A clear step-by-step -step set of instructions is called an algorithm. It sounds crazy, but so crazy it just might work? The first problem was, what's the best way to figure stuff out? Scientific phenomena all seem so different. How could one algorithm possibly solve all problems? Well, although the ways we understand the world are very different, there are some things they have in common. Usually, we observe the world, record data, and try to figure out a law that describes it. This process is known as the scientific method. Sometimes there are many hypotheses to explain the data, but it's a general rule that the simpler the explanation, the more likely it is to be the right one. This is summed up in Oakham's razor. The simplest explanation is usually the best one. It's called Oakham's razor because it shaves away unnecessary assumptions. Solomonov created a general theory of inductive reasoning based on these ideas. There was a problem though. It's not always obvious what the most elegant or simple solution is. These are highly subjective words. Solomonov needed a way to objectively measure the complexity of different hypotheses. It's here in our story that we're joined by two other characters, Gregory Chaitin and Andrei Kolmogorov. One American, one Russian, both extraordinary mathematicians. So the problem was, how do we compare the complexity of different things? What's more complex, a Mozart piece or a Hemingway novel? A sea slug or Fermat's Last Theorem? It may not seem like it, but there is something that all of these things have in common. In fact, something that everything in the universe has in common. It's all made up of information. Information can be thought of as the resolution of uncertainty. The most fundamental unit of information is the bit, usually represented by a 1 or a 0. How in the world can all of these things be made up of 1s and zeros? Well, think about this. Everything your computer or phone does is represented and understood in terms of bits. Every single program run on the computer is, at the most fundamental level, just a series of 1s and zeros. In principle, all of your sensory input and the laws of the universe can be represented by a long sequence of ones and zeros. These are called strings. So now, rather than dealing with vastly different entities, we can convert everything into strings. When things are in the same language, it becomes possible to measure and compare them. Now, we just need a way of deciding which sequence of ones and zeros is simpler and which is more complex. So how do we do that? Well, let me ask you, of these two strings, which do you think is simpler and which do you think is more complex? A good place to start might be asking, which is easier to describe? The first string is just the digits one zero repeated 25 times. We can program a computer to print it by giving it the instructions or algorithm, print one zero times 25, stop. Of course, the exact phrasing will depend on the programming language, but you get the idea. So some strings can be described in ways shorter than writing out the whole string. Just like some numbers can be described in ways shorter than saying every single digit. But how about this string? There doesn't seem to be an obvious way to tell the computer to print it other than literally saying print, then naming every single digit, stop. Now, Let's remember what these ones and zeros represent. They're the basic unit of information and information is the resolution of uncertainty. So the more information needed to describe something, the more uncertainty it had to begin with, right? 
the less bits it needs, the less uncertainty it had to begin with. I think it's pretty intuitive to say that the less uncertainty something has, the simpler it is. Don't you? This is what our team thought too, and they defined the measure of complexity of an object to be the number of bits needed to describe it. In other words, the longer the string, the more complex it is. Compacting strings into shorter strings is called data compression. But we don't want just any shorter string. We want the shortest string. The expression isn't any simpler explanation is usually the best one. It's the simplest explanation is usually the best one. The shortest possible string used to describe an object is called the Kolmogorov complexity of that object. So here we see that Solomonov's goal of an algorithm for truth is the same thing as programming a computer to tell us the Kolmogorov complexity of any string. Before we go on, I just wanted to pause for a sec to take a moment to appreciate the enormity of what's been done here. We've basically boiled all of the scientific method down to the art of data compression. We've linked philosophy, mathematics, computation, information, complexity, randomness, reasoning, and physics all in one theory. Incredible. The idea of an algorithm for truth suddenly doesn't seem so crazy. But finding the shortest string is not an obvious task. Just like with numbers, there are many ways to describe a string. Is print 10 times 25 stop really the most compact way to describe this string? If it is, how do we know? And if it's not, how do we find out what is? Let's consider a program, find shortest string. We give the program a set of data, encoded as a string of course, and it carries out the following steps. It goes through every possible string, starting from the shortest, 0, then 1, then 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on. It then interprets each string as a program in some programming language. Remember that a program is just a sequence of 1s and zeros, so some of these strings will inevitably be programs. If the string cannot be interpreted as a program, find shorter string moves on. If it can be interpreted as a program, find shorter string runs it. It then returns the output of the program as a string. Next, it compares this output against the original data string we used as input. If it matches, find shorter string stops. If it doesn't match, it moves on to the next string in the list. This would be a pretty good candidate for an algorithm for truth. For example, let's pretend we don't know what this sequence of numbers is and use it as input into find shortest string. So we want find shortest string to return to us the rule that generates this data. So it starts going through every possible string, interpreting them as programs and returning their output. At some point, it will encounter the string which represents the formula for pi. Find shortest string will interpret it and run it as a program, and its output will be the digits of pi encoded as a string. So of course, when we compare it to our input string, it will match and find shortest string will terminate, having found the string which best describes the input data. Because we're starting from the shortest string and going through in increasing order, it will be the shortest string that describes the input data. We've computed the Kolmogorov complexity. We'd have our algorithm for truth. Hallelujah! But wait, there are still loads of unsolved problems. Scientists are still employed all over the world. Maybe in our excitement, we've overlooked something. All programs are made of a finite number of bits. So let's say find shortest string is made of 100 bits. Now consider another program, Barry's Paradox, made of 40 bits. We give Barry's Paradox a number m as input, and you must return the first string that cannot be described in less than m bits. So say we give it the number, 150. The task of the Berry's Paradox program is to find the first string which can't be described in less than 150 bits. This is pretty easy if we use the help of find shortest string. Berry's Paradox goes through all strings in order and feeds them to find shortest string. 
The first time find shorter string returns a string larger than 150 bits long means the input that was given to find shorter string is the first string that cannot be described in less than 150 bits. Barry's paradox returns that string. But wait, there's a slight problem. Have you spotted it? We just described the first string that can't be described in fewer than 150 bits using only 140 bits. This is a contradiction. If the program find shorter string was computable, it would produce countless contradictions, just like this one. If we were to actually run this program, it would loop forever, never giving us an answer. It doesn't matter how big the programs are, billions, even trillions of bits, there will always be a string of longer length, and so there will always be room for the contradiction. Kolmogorov complexity is uncomputable. Solomonov's algorithm for truth is impossible. It's not that we haven't found it yet or that we're not clever enough. It's proven to be impossible. This may have been a blow to Solomonov, who worked his entire life on this idea, but, you know, if old Solomonov could go back in time and tell young Solomonov not to bother with a fruitless endeavor, I don't think he would have. This search led to the field of algorithmic information theory, the study of information, computation, complexity, and randomness. Wherever there are patterns to be studied, algorithmic information theory can be applied. What I find most fascinating are the philosophical implications. This result proves an intrinsic limit on human knowledge. It also shows so beautifully that where philosophy can ask the questions, mathematics can answer. I'm stoked to have been able to share this story with you and I hope it's given you a new appreciation for the power of mathematics. Algorithms have come a long way in the past few years. You'd think that with all the advances in technology, your internet security and privacy would be a given, but it's not. By default, your internet service provider can see every single site that you visit, even in incognito mode or when you clear your browsing history. They are legally allowed to sell all your data to advertisers and companies for profit, but you can protect yourself with ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN reroutes your connection through secure encrypted servers, so your ISP can't see what websites you're visiting. It can also reroute it to a server in any country of your choice, making geo-restrictions a thing of the past. My favorite thing about using ExpressVPN is all the extra shows and movies I can watch on Netflix that aren't available in Australia. Like Inception. I just change my location to Germany and boom, I can watch Inception or I can change it to Hong Kong and watch my favorite childhood anime, Naruto. If you're based in the US, you can change your location to Australia and watch Rick and Morty. Find out how you can get three months free by clicking the link in the description box below or go to expressvpn.com slash upandatom. Thank you to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this episode and I will see you in the next one. Bye.